Buenas tardes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Universidad Popular's virtual classroom. My name is Arcela Nunez Alvarez, and I am one of the co-directors of Universidad Popular. Universidad Popular is a grassroots community-based organization that serves all of San Diego County and the border region with programs that promote civic participation and education for all. This evening, we are grateful that you are taking the time to join us in having very important conversations that are timely, that are relevant, and that have real impact in the lives of people throughout our community. First of all, we would like to thank everyone, but in particular, we wanna take a moment to thank uh, several of our colleagues and elected officials who are joining us this evening. Um, we have San Marcos City Council member, Randy Walton, we also have San Marcos City Council member, Maria Nunez. We have Commissioner Leti Robles. We have Assembly member, Tasha Borner Horvath's office. Thank you, Suleyma, for being with us. And some of our community members who are doing dedicated work promoting um, education and justice for everyone in our community such as Dr. Beatriz Villarreal. Tonight's program is a conversation that takes us back to basic understandings, particularly how our government works, the ideal and the reality. We would like our audience to better understand how the district attorney's office works what exactly it does for all of us every day and how our community uh, is benefited from the programs and services the office provides, but also how it impacts all of us and sometimes adversely. The conversation that we put together this evening is a conversation based on an inventory of questions, of concerns, of ideas that we have gathered through Universidad Popular over the course of weeks, months, and years. We have been listening to our community and all of our community educators are part of this impacted community. Much of the information and the issues and questions may resonate with you with immigrants and with other communities of color. We are hoping that this is only the beginning of many timely and important conversations that we hope to have for months and years ahead. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. We will do our best to address uh, all the questions but in the event that we are not able to get to your questions and your concerns, we do hope that you will join us in future events. Now, I would like to introduce you to one of my colleagues who will be helping us to facilitate the conversation this evening. My colleague, Alara Chilton. She is a San Diego community advocate who has fought for civil rights including changes to the criminal justice system, uh, fighting to ban the chokehold, and overall improving police practices, particularly as they impact us and our communities of color. She is an attorney who started her career as a prosecutor, has intimate knowledge of the way that it works, and she now represents victims of sexual assault and abuse in um, civil cases. She is past president and current board member of the San Diego La Raza Lawyers Association. 
please join me in welcoming uh, Alara, who will walk us through the next part of the program. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you for what we hope will be the first of many wonderful community conversations. And the idea is to um, really just gather education and information so that we better understand how our government works and how it impacts our everyday lives. It is my distinct pleasure today to introduce our district attorney, Summer Stefan. Summer has an extensive biography, so I'm gonna to try to keep it brief, but I assure you it was a challenge. She has served in public office for many years um, as a prosecutor here in San Diego before she served as chief of the district, uh, I'm sorry, before she was elected, including chief of the district attorney's office in North County, that branch, as well as chief of the sex crimes unit and human trafficking division. Uh, and then uh, at, was elected our, our DA in 2018. She's held numerous positions in leadership at a, at a national, state and local level regarding public safety. This put these positions include serving as vice president of the National District Attorneys Association, co-chair of the California District Attorneys Association and Human Trafficking Committee, and the National Association of Women Judges Human Trafficking Committee. And I want to say that this is particularly important because you may not believe this, but attorneys are a tough crowd. And this shows that Summer is really good, I think, at getting the support of her colleagues. And believe me, attorneys are tough. Summer has also served on the governor's task force for high-risk sex offenders and sexually violent predators. She has spearheaded the innovative Know the Price campaign, which focused on reducing sexual assault on colleges' campuses and other camp campaigns focused on reducing crime. It is my distinct pleasure to have you here with us today, Summer. Thank you so much uh, for that warm welcome, uh, Alara, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Arcella Nunez Alvarez, for this invitation and all the council members and uh, people that are on, all of the people joining us. I really, really appreciate this opportunity to have a conversation. And like uh, Ms. Arcella said, to to also listen and in order to serve better. Wonderful, and I just wanted to add that if there are any questions, we'll be taking those questions at the end of the program. So at seven o'clock, we will start those. But if you have any questions, please include them in their chat. Arcella, take it away. Thank you. We are going to go ahead and get started. Um, Council member Corina Contreras from Vista, I see that you joined us. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of questions that came up and we would like to get through as many of them um, and have the opportunity to get to questions that you might be working on right now. Uh, DA Stefan, um, you have a large office that employs uh, over 300 attorneys, um, serve all over uh, San Diego County. Our community, we find particularly immigrants, Latinos, and other folks who are not as familiar with the functioning of government, um, essentially lump um, all law enforcement agencies into one body the DA, the courts, um, can you help us to better understand the difference between the DA's office, the police, the courts, um, and please include sort of the, the powers that you have and the interfaces with each of these different entities, um, kind of taking us back to basics of government. All right, thank you. And it's a great opportunity. My team and I have been very excited. Yoli Apalategi, who's uh, with us, is our Director of Community and Government Affairs. And um, she has tried to help us make sure that uh, we make this point clear of our different roles. You know, the, the, we're here to serve. That, that's basically my, my whole life and uh, what our team is about. We're here to serve you. And it's really important that you, everybody who joined us and everyone out there understands what we do so that you can leverage our services because we work for you. We are your uh, public servants. And we have a very unique role. 
we are your public prosecutor. Um, we are not the police departments and we are not the courts. Um, our powers are not um, arrest powers, uh, but we are charged with making a decision whether a case should be prosecuted and brought to court uh, under the law. And that means that we have a higher standard. The standard that we have to use is beyond a reasonable doubt. We have to bring a case only if the evidence and the facts support that a crime has been committed beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury. Now the jury or a court will make the ultimate decision, but we have to ethically believe that we can prove that case. The police have a probable cause standard for arrest that and for bringing a case. So one of the things that that we do is we very carefully review the cases because we understand that people's liberty is at stake. And on average, about 30% of the cases are not filed uh, because they don't meet the level of proof or for other uh, justice related reasons. Uh, we take that responsibility very seriously. The other thing that is unique about the DA's office is that we do not represent a person or an interest. We only represent the people as a whole. Um, and that's very important because it means that it doesn't matter if people are rich or poor, if they've been a victim of a crime, we are the public prosecutor, the people's prosecutor that brings that action. And it's very important to say that it's completely irrelevant if the victim of any crime from uh, domestic violence to human trafficking to murder, attempt murder, fraud, it doesn't matter if the victim is documented or doesn't have documentation. If they are on San Diego County jurisdiction land, they are victims under state law and they receive the exact same services by the DA's office, by our office, than anybody else. One aspect of our office that is not well known is that we are not just the people's prosecutor, for all felony crimes and all misdemeanor crimes across the whole county, except for misdemeanors in the city of San Diego. So for all intensive purposes, we're the people's prosecutor. We're also the largest provider of victim services for our county, serving 15,000 average number of victims annually. And this is part of why I was so excited about this talk is because the victim services that we provide can be life-saving to people in crisis. And we often um, know that people, we see, for example, GoFundMe pages when people have a tragedy, someone is killed in their family and they don't have burial services. And they don't know that if a crime has been committed, then our office provides help with everything that is needed, again, regardless of status. Um, it's only whether somebody has been a crime victim or a family of a crime victim. Um, so we have a completely different role. We also obviously have a public corruption division that prosecutes corruption, whether it's by police misconduct, uh, by um, misconduct by public officials. So we're an independent prosecutor. We work on a daily basis with law enforcement to set policies that affect public safety. But we have a different role. Our role is to prosecute a case in court and to protect victims and to bring justice.
And that includes protecting the rights of the accused. So that's, that's a really good overview. Thank you for that. I know you stated that irrespective of the immigrant um, status, so if someone is undocumented, they will still receive the same protections afforded to anyone uh, under your office. And so if you could talk a little bit more regarding the specific resources available to the, the community um, with respect to, I know you have a new resource center that's opened up in San Marcos. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. So there's a range of services. We have victim advocates that are specialized in crisis and trauma, and they uh, receive the police report. And even before a case is solved, they will call the victim. And sometimes people won't return their calls because there's a fear of government. And there's, there, they might not know what the role is of that victim advocate. We want people to know if a victim advocate from the DA's office calls you, um, then it's, you know, they're there to help you, not to question you or anything else. And they provide everything from, if, if uh, sadly burial service is needed, that's what they help arrange. If um, mental health trauma services are needed, if the medical bills need to be paid, they will pay them up front and help the victims um, not have to bear the, the burden if they don't have medical insurance or something like that. They accompany the victim to court. They explain all of the rights that go along. But Alara, what you're referring to is, I'm very excited about this. In the North County, we have had less services for um, our victims. And what we're opening in San Marcos, it's, it's getting set up right now as we speak and it should open in October, November, hopefully, um, if everything goes on schedule, but will open soon, um, a one-stop family justice center for the North County region in San Marcos. And it will have services. When a victim walks in, they will get services, whether it's a safety plan to get away from their domestic violence abuser, help with housing to, to be safe, child abuse, sexual assault, human trafficking, elder abuse. It's gonna be a state of the art, all comprehensive. And what is really important about this and why I'm so excited is when I say one-stop shop, it is in that it will have within it all of the child advocacy, forensic advocacy, trauma care services all in one place. So the victim doesn't have to go to multiple places. We know that when people suffer from trauma and then you hand them a card to go here and there and everywhere, we lose them, you know, and, and um, they need our help. And that's what this is gonna provide. So Palomar Hospital is gonna come on board as a partner and be, and there are a certified child advocacy center so that child abuse, everything will get help right in one, one place. And of course, we are very cognizant of uh, the area and our high immigrant population, the different languages. So everything is being accounted for to be trauma informed, to be ready to, to serve our diverse uh, population in the best way possible. So one of the things that I heard you say was that um, you have a lot of victim resources. Did I hear you correctly that it's not for every victim? So for example, if I, God forbid, is I'm a victim of theft, right? I'm not someone who could take advantage, right? It's for more of the more serious crimes. Is that correct? So, um, so in terms of the trauma services, the medical services, those are for more serious violent crimes. However, even if somebody is a victim of a theft or a fraud or identity theft, a victim advocate will still explain their rights and go through the system with them. They're called Marcy's rights and help them to navigate because it can be very confusing. So they will get some assistance that's commensurate with the harm that they suffered. Um, as opposed to under the law, there's a state compensation monies that are available for more violent crime victims. 
Okay. And just so that we all understand, by the way, congratulations on this new center being opened pretty soon. Fingers crossed you're on your timeline. Um, you mentioned that it's a one-stop shop. A couple of points I wanted to address. Victims should still call 911. They should still report it and not assume that because it's a quote unquote one-stop shop, that that step shouldn't happen, right? Absolutely. If it's an emergency, you call 911. But what we do know, and you know this, Alara, from your work with sexual assault victims um, and domestic violence, is sometimes people are not ready for police intervention. They're, they're not ready to file that police report, but they still need help. They need a safety plan. They need a shelter. They need a place to relocate because that's a big barrier to leaving abusive relationships is where are you going to go? Who's going to feed your kids? Um, especially when we know that abusers often control the finances, they control every move, they pay for the cell phones. So you don't really have anything to, to be free. Um, and so we know that people have to go on their own timeline. And therefore, it's important that this center doesn't have a barrier if you've already filed the police report or not. You get the services anyway, but you still have to, if you're interested in a criminal prosecution, then you need to call 911 and file a police report and proceed that way. And can you also break it down for us when you say that the, um, these centers have forensic advocacy, what do you mean by forensic advocacy? So all sorts. So for example, you know, I, I did the last school shooting case that happened in San Diego. It was at, at the Kelly Elementary School. And before I became the district attorney, I tried that case. There were multiple victims under six years old. Well, it's, you know, we don't, we don't want them to be interviewed in a non-trauma informed way. And so they get a forensic interview, not by a police officer, by, but by someone specialized in a, a talking to children and getting the facts from children in a trauma-informed way. So those forensic interviews with children who are victims of molest or other abuse would happen there. If you're a sexual assault victim, your sexual assault exam would happen there at the wow. center. If you're a domestic violence victim, a domestic uh, forensic exam for strangulation or other injuries would happen all in the same place by forensic nurses. Um, and so a range of uh, services that you normally have to go here and there for, for will be provided all in one place. That's wonderful. And when I had um, that horrific experience as a sexual assault survivor, I didn't have the opportunity to go to a one-stop place, right? So I went to the hospital, the emergency room, and I didn't even have sensitive doctors, right? So this is a really significant step and service that you're offering. On behalf of victims, thank you. Thank you, Alara, for also your courage of uh, speaking out about this issue. Thank you. Um, one last thing I wanted to cover regarding resources is, I know you have a great website I know there's videos there that people can see. Many members in our community don't have access to the internet. Um, do, are there ways that we could otherwise reach information about your office? You know, we try to be very accessible. I mean, we have a Facebook page and we, we publish information, pertinent information in Spanish also. Um, you know, our website, if somebody is able to reach it is very helpful and it has a translation bar and it also has things in Spanish and other languages. Um, you know, if you're able to sign up by email, if somebody has email to, to a newsletter, our newsletter provides the latest information about scams and different things happening. We saw some many scams that were targeting our immigrant communities. Um, you know, fake offers of getting somebody sped up in line to get their, um, to get their, um, you know, their, their green card and other things. So we alert the community. Um, but also we have community partnership prosecutors now who aren't in the courtroom, but they're in the community. They're working with a variety of on the ground agencies 
um, you know, this interaction with, with the, the Universidad is really something we're very excited about. And, um, but we also interact with the, with the um, Employee Rights Center, you know, and um, different uh, organizations on the ground that help um, the Chicano Federation where we did some training with them. Uh, we try to, we know that everybody is looking at our website. So we try to work through on the ground organizations that are culturally competent so that they can learn what our resources are. And when somebody comes to them, they can provide that information. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for sharing about all the resources that the office uh, offers our community. Uh, oftentimes, uh, many of us who are part of the immigrant Latino community, um, especially if we are the ones in our families and communities who speak the language, we end up being the navigators, the ones who look at the website, who go back and share that information. So the, the next questions that, that we thought through um, come from the experiences that we have had accompanying uh, many of our own family members through uh, as they navigate uh, the process um, once there is an incident and they end up being arrested. Uh, many of us are family advocates where we actually show up with them to court um, and then as the process moves forward, we oftentimes find out that that particular charge or arrest in the future ends up uh, leading in uh, immigration deportation proceedings. So we wanted to, uh, to first of all, um, ask you to uh, help us better understand how we can inform our community, given that such a large number of our community members are immigrants. I myself am an immigrant. Um, and we see so many of our families being separated today um, because they, um, they end up going through a deportation proceeding. We have thousands of families that are living divided lives, both on the Mexican side and the US side. Can you tell us sort of when individuals get to your office, their case gets to your office, um, at what point do you know their immigration status? Um, and sort of, we wanna learn better how that status uh, gets carried throughout the process as you see them um, and their cases. So do you know a person's immigration status when you can, when the DA's office um, charges uh, an individual? Yeah, most of the time, um, no, we don't know unless there's something in the statement that the individual makes to police that indicates their status because they volunteered that status. And because of trying to really run an office where we don't um, separate um, under state law, there's no separation between um, folks that whether victim or offender, um, both are treat, should be treated the same um, whether they are um, documented or undocumented. So our policy is not to ask those questions, but we learn about that from the defense attorneys. So we, um, you know, once somebody's charged with a crime ethically, we cannot speak to them. And that's why you're asking such an excellent question because we want to ultimately do justice. And the more information, the better. And so if you as the navigator, as the trusted ad, uh, navigators and advocates for the family want us to know that information, then um, telling that information to the criminal defense attorney, and as you know, everybody gets assigned, if they can't afford an attorney, they get assigned a public defender. And our public defender's office is very competent and well-resourced. and um, you know, will tell us that information if it's relevant. 
And the information is relevant. Uh, and this is the reason that a, a law passed a few years ago that says that we are supposed to consider the collateral consequences that may come and disproportionately affect someone who is not um, a, who is not a U.S. citizen. And so, for example, the impact of a petty theft misdemeanor on somebody who is, um, you know, not uh, you know needing a legal status. Is still important and relevant, but it certainly is nowhere near the consequences that would come from a petty theft misdemeanor on someone who is has a green card or a visa and trying to seek um, to become uh, a, res a legal resident. And so it essentially can be a, a devastation for them from their family connections and everything else. So, so knowing that information is important and fortunately now under the law, because we have to follow the law, we are allowed to consider it in reaching a fair and just disposition. But one of the strategies that I used um, when I, uh, by listening to the communities, I learned about this is I um, began a very large, uh, misdemeanor diversion program that everyone is eligible to except for domestic violence, sexual abuse, and DUI. Those are the three categories of cases that are not eligible. But every other type of misdemeanor, uh, petty theft, commercial burglary, simple assault, um, many of those that we see will get diversion. Um, a, and it's a very low bar diversion where they will end up with their record sealed. And uh, we found this to be a really good response to not causing devastating consequences, not only to the immigrant community, but to you know, young people who make stupid mistakes and we don't want them to live by that mistake and be defined by it for the rest of their, their life as they seek employment, as they, you know, having that come up on their record time and time again. And um, let me tell you even the more exciting news because I'm, I have to make sure there's public safety. So well, I, I have to be transparent and honest, meaning if what I'm doing in diversion results in crime, that person committing more crimes, then I've got to adjust. But what we found is our diversion program, which is the DA Community Justice Initiative, has resulted in a 5% recidivism rate. That is that is lower than anywhere in the nation in terms of people committing new crimes. That's what recidivism means. That means going back and repeating because it is very successful. It, it is a training, 12 hour training that helps people um, think through their decisions. It's called cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's not punitive. It helps make their life better in terms of making better decisions that keep them safe and keep the community safe. Summer, I'm really excited that you mentioned that diversion program that you have implemented for misdemeanors. And I know you noted some important exceptions, but if you could spell it out for us, because having worked in the uh, legal system and having had clients before I was uh, doing my civil work, I saw a lot of persons who were accused of misdemeanors, convicted of misdemeanors, and then they lost their jobs. You know, so once they were in the system, even for low level crimes like misdemeanors, it was really hard for them to, to move forward with their lives. So if you could speak to exactly what the misdemeanor diversion program does, for example, are they now in the system? And if they complete the cognitive behavioral therapy course, do, do they not um, stay in the system? When I say system, do they not have a prior conviction that appears on their record? You could speak to what exactly the diversion program works, how it works. Right, I mean, the goal is for them not to get a conviction so they don't get sentenced. 
And it is so, it's not a year long diversion program. It's 12 hours of cognitive behavioral therapy and four hours of community service. So it's a very low bar. And this is why we wanted to test it to make sure that it is working. And we we're finding that it's working beautifully more than where you have these very, very elaborative prog elaborate programs that keep people you know, waiting to get a job for a year or two until they complete. So as soon as they're done with it, it's an automatic, they don't even have to come back to court. It's negative reporting. The agency, in this case, it's Say San Diego that helps us with this program, a community-based uh, program. They do a negative report that the person fulfilled their obligation and then we take care of it. So they don't even have to take time away from work again to come to court. And it is sealed from their record. So it does not ever show as a conviction. In addition to that, we, we also, I should mention, when um, Proposition 64 passed with regard to marijuana, we, um, we handled 25,000 cases going back in time and either dismissed the convictions or lowered felony to misdemeanor according to the law. Now, a lot of people don't know that happened to their kid. They might still be trying to get a job reporting that they have a felony marijuana conviction when in fact they no longer have it because that was done without um, their presence. And that's why you know lawyers and organizations that advocate can check with us and the public defender to see if that name has already been removed and that way they don't have to be, you know, still embroiled in having these records that are probably gone at this point. Now, just to be clear, that diversion program with the exception of DV, sexual, uh, sex abuse and DUIs is everyone who has been arrested for a misdemeanor and then, um, you know, put into uh, a police report that goes before your office. Uh, is everybody eligible with the exception of those uh, crimes I mentioned? Yes, everyone is eligible, but um, it's, you know, it's possible that if, if the person has a um, something else going on, like, like, it, uh, like a kind of a, a stalking scenario or some threat to public safety that it will be screened, but somehow it won't happen. But we really have not seen many of those cases. Pretty much everyone on their first time misdemeanor has been able to get this. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that um, elaboration, um, Alara. I wanted to get back and sort of ask, just because it, one of the things that we see out in the community very frequently, uh, particularly, um, like I said, folks who are from the immigrant communities, um, is that um, an arrest, a charge, an uh, actual plea that they take, or an actual conviction, um, you know, any one of those, and obviously the, the more serious, the more um, of an impact that it will have on one's um, opportunity to get immig uh, immigration relief um, or even to face deportation if they're already uh, residents. But I was really happy to learn that your office has on staff an immigration attorney. Uh, could you tell us more about how um, the work is done, um, whether your office collaborates with a vast number of immigration attorneys in our community because what I commonly see is a big disconnect sort of between the criminal justice system and the immigration system. And so uh, I'm wondering how your office is facilitating that communication um, and bridging that big gap that we see in the community. Yes, I mean, I, I realize that we are not immigration experts. And so when we're trying to evaluate what is the just um, result, what is the right disposition in a case, we, are, we wanna take in what are the collateral consequences that could happen to the person that may be disproportionate 
with what they did. You know, it, you know, sometimes crimes are, you know, big and they have to be handled that way, whether it has an immigration consequence or not. So we wanted to have our own consultant that's an immigration expert that will educate us. So when we have a case and the defense, the criminal defense attorney comes to us and says, you know, if the, my client pleads to this charge, he's going to lose his, you know, he's been here since he was a child, he's going to be deported. Um, you know, look at all the good stuff he's done with his life. We can use so that we can, we can have confidence in our decision making, since we're responsible we can have this immigration attorney consultant who, you know, with Buck County, everybody has to go through the whole background and all of that. That's why we have somebody on staff so that they're available and we can run the scenario by the person. And they would say, yes, that's true. You know, that is very likely the consequence. They would be deported, so on and so forth. Or they would say, actually, you know, um, this plea is not automatic um, deportation. It, it affords the person the opportunity to do this and that. So we're, you know, we are not experts in this area. So having this resource allows us to be more fair, more just, take in more information and um, apply it to do, to, you know, to do equity and justice for everybody. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, again, for for us, and especially in the border region, um, anytime that we have an opportunity to accompany immigrants, we, we, we just continue to see that there is still a lot of work that we need to do um, as a county to be able to provide services that are um, linguistically responsive that are culturally, you know, responsive to our community. Um, so we do think that this, uh, this bridge with the immigrant community and with the immigration attorneys in the area is one where we continue, uh, we continue to work on because there's an ongoing need for that. Um, the other part that I think Alara and I were thinking through is um, how does your office um, ensure equity given the movements that we're facing right now? Times are changing. Uh, there's a great deal of reform happening because of grassroots efforts, because of you know, extensive advocacy. Um, so how um, does this relate to uh, penal code um, 1170D and sort of the, the cases that might be subject to, to those reviews. Yes, and, and you know, um, having responsible reform to make sure that, that uh, equity, inequities are corrected, you know, is, is very important. Um, and we were the San Diego DA's office, my office was the first office to apply this penal code section 1170D. In fact, the assembly member who authored it, assembly member Ting came out to San Diego, um, which we really, we don't, we don't need, you know, the thanks, but we appreciated the gesture. Um, and what 1170D does and you know, I have to tell you that several um, Hispanic and immigrant uh, members of our community have taken advantage of it. Um, they have brought, uh, you know, what it allows is to have a case where a loved one uh, was sentenced to a sentence that didn't fit the crime. It was too harsh for what the person actually did. And 1170D allows us to, no matter how much time has passed, to bring the case back to court to do a resentencing. And it has to be done in front of the judge that initially did the sentence so that you're not forum shopping, but you're going back to the same judge. And um, if that judge isn't available, uh, you know, retired, then you will be assigned to a different judge. And we've done um, about eight cases so far, and we're reviewing a hundred more. 
um, through the system. And people can apply directly to our office. There's a very short form uh, or a family member can bring it to the attention or a lawyer can say, you know what, I had a client that I just think it, it was, um, it's the sentencing for this crime did, it was more like if he had committed murder, but what he committed was bad, but it wasn't at the level of the sentence. Um, and so we bring people back and it, it happens that most of the people that we've resentenced have been uh, men of color, um, you know, that, that have been ones that we brought back for resentencing. Um, you know, some of the laws that uh, were three strikes and other laws, um, you know, are not now what we have. And so be being able to look, not just look forward, but look back in time. And it's, it's very heartwarming. I've met with some of these families myself um, and the impact on them of having their loved one back um, is, is tremendous. It's not the same as um, the conviction review unit. We have a unit that reviews claims of innocence, meaning somebody says, I didn't commit this crime. I, I want the DNA tested or something like that. We, we would do that, obviously. But we also have, and we're very committed to it, this is a sentence review. Uh, where we're reviewing the sentence to make sure it was just. Thank you, Summer, for that. That's very encouraging. And I'm not surprised as an activist, I'm certain many of our community here today is not surprised when you say that those men who have been resentenced, many of them have been African-American. Um, because as you well know, there has been um, a the, if you want to call it implicit bias, perhaps it's racism, either way you spin it, we still have this criminal justice system where we know that persons of color are treated differently. They often get um, either arrested more or face more charges or they're sentenced differently than their, than their, counter, than their counterparts. So in that, uh, in that context, I want to talk to you for a moment about this notion of overcharging. And when I say overcharging, what I'm referring to is that many people inform Universidad Popular that they feel that they are being overcharged by the district attorney's office. Um, it's not surprising to you, I'm sure, that there is a perception by activists, immigration, and defense attorneys that the office files more charges against members of the Latinx community and other communities of color as compared to other groups for the same conduct. And like I mentioned, Latinx members are also more likely to be prosecuted. Um, and persons of color. And over the past few years, we now have the data to support that racial bias exists in the criminal justice system. So for example, I know you're very familiar with the 2016 San Diego State study that showed that black and Latinos are more likely to be searched when stopped by San Diego police. And when they are searched, they're less likely than um, whites to be found with contraband and illegal items. Can you share with us, uh, I know you've spoken to how you determine what to charge. But what do you say to those in our community who say there is overcharging? Well, since I've been district attorney, you know, I've been committed to making sure that uh, we really apply and pursue a fair and equal justice for all. And this is, this is a work in progress. You know, it is it is by listening to the community, it is by listening to defense attorneys, by looking at the cases, and also by having policies, you know, frameworks for disposition that are very clear. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to say that, that this has never happened or, or won't happen, that a case you know, is overcharged, is assessed um, over what it should be at the time. But what, what I can say is that we, um, you know, we formed a core team, a committee on race equity. We changed many of our frameworks. Our team is really built on a lot of diversity and inclusion that we intentionally brought 
um, a board, you know, my executive team is, is much more diverse than the population in San Diego. And that's because they're the best, you know, it's not, it's because they're the best team I could have. And I'm lucky that to have them. So we've done many things, but what's really key is I have an open door and I've kept that open door pretty much my whole career because something could happen that is not right, you know, and I want to hear about it and I want to try to correct it by having this open door, by having conversations. But what I need, what I find sometimes though, Alara, is someone will give me a case and then I'll look at it and sometimes it turns out that the facts are a lot more egregious than the person described to their family or to their advocate. And that the charges you know, were appropriate. And where I find that, no, this is, a little, this, is, this is too much for this person for what they did, then we correct it, you know? So, and that can only happen by these two-way conversations. But I can tell you that we have an intentional effort to reduce bias through multiple trainings we've done, through frameworks, through checking our systems, our data systems to make sure that we have even dispositions by putting diverse people in court doing those dispositions. So we are really trying hard um, to, um, to really live by the pursuit for an equal justice for all. And I hear you when you say that this is an ongoing process and it, in many ways, I feel like it's like the beginning because I know past DAs didn't have the same lens that you've just described. Um, when I was researching this issue, I noted that in other cities, I believe it was San Francisco uh, and others that um, actually in an effort to ensure that we remove that type of bias, they now prepare police reports for review before uh, DA's offices in which information regarding their um, ethnicity and their last names, I believe, are removed so that when the prosecutor reviews the police reports for assessing possible charges, that information can no longer be used and you know, kept into the psyche to result in implicit bias. Is that something your office would be open to doing? You know, I'm definitely open to doing it, uh, Alara, and I looked into it. Um, I did not think that it was um, viable. And the reason is that the first time that somebody goes to court to arraign someone, they have to see who the person is. And most of the uh, question marks come with regard to disposition, as opposed to um, the beginning part. It's kind of like, what did the person get as a dispo, as a sentence? So within three days, as you know, people that we have in custody, we have to arraign them. So if you had a blindfold on, it's going to be taken off and you're going to know who that person is. We also um, made sure by looking at our system, whether we are rejecting um, the same number of cases for all populations or whether we are favoring anybody, um, you know, where we reject more cases when it comes to, let's say, white folks, um, as opposed to Hispanic, Latinx, or, or Black. And we did not find that discrepancy you know, in terms of our issuing. Now, again, I have an open door if there's a specific case that, that we should look at. But um, at the end of the day, I, I, was, I was open to it, but I did not see that, that the real transformation in the system is gonna happen um, in that way for that momentary brief time that um, you are um, trying to, you know, remove somebody's last name. The reality is that, you know, any experienced prosecutor, as you read these reports and as you know the patterns, if you know what gang set the person is in or other things, you may have a visual of what you think you're dealing with. And um, I think more transformation happens with 
proper training and with a culture that we are instituting about a fair and equal justice for all and having a diverse team that can really look and mirror our community. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, uh, elaborating um, on that thought, um, in North County and especially in many of the communities where we live, um, we've personally have experienced the way that um, our entire community at times gets criminalized. And we see this, uh, especially around the way that uh, issues around gangs um, are, are addressed. Uh, North County has the majority of gang injunctions in the county. Um, we have never supported gang injunctions, but these court approved civil um, court orders uh, have been in existence for many years. We, we have seen how they've devastated families, uh, targeted youth, um, exposed particularly youth of color to being over-criminalized and hyper-criminalized. So we wanted to ask uh, what the timeline might look like for, um, for these gang injunctions and how we do away with them because we don't think that's the way to deal with uh, issues in our community, particularly related to youth. Yeah, uh, I, I had a concern about uh, the gang injunctions. So um, what I did is I um, asked uh, the team to take a look at our gang injunctions and if they, um, they are stale, if they've produced uh, public safety outcomes you know, in the current time, because our gang injunctions were put in place uh, 10 to 20 years ago. And, um, but they're permanent, you know, very few things are permanent, but gang injunctions are civil injunctions that remain permanently. Um, and, you know, talking, I have a faith advisory um, committee and they, they talk to me about, you know, kids that were part of gangs, you're know, not doing good things, but have moved on and are trying to integrate and, these, these gang injunctions keep coming up and keeping them back. Um, and so I looked at the law and the law was not clear. The law said that basically someone could apply to remove their gang injunction. So I asked the question, how many people removed their gang injunction? We had about 800 individuals on, gang, on these gang injunctions across the county. And only 10 people had sought removal of their gang injunctions. This, of course, came as no surprise since individuals are not lawyers and just dealing with the criminal justice system or with the legal system is, is a barrier. So um, I set up objective criteria where if somebody has been away from crime for five years, they, we would apply for them and remove them from the gang injunction list. So we did that and we filed about 300 petitions for folks who have been away from crime for five years of the 800. And the judges granted them um, and they felt that it was appropriate that the DA move to do this. So then I asked the question, um, could I remove the whole gang injunction? itself as stale. Um, and there was actually no law on this point, uh, Arcella, um, but there was no law against the point. And so I worked with all of the police chiefs across the county, because of course, I wanna make sure that I'm not doing anything that impacts public safety negatively. And I'm really pleased to report that after we walk through all of the individuals and the impact and the staleness of the gang injunctions. Um, they all supported me in filing uh, motions with the court to remove all of the gang injunctions. The judges granted them. So as, as of about a month and a half ago, we no longer have gang, gang injunctions in San Diego County. 
Um, and so if any individual thinks they're still on a gang injunction, they are not. Um, I sent letters to everybody that I could find addresses to, um, to tell them that they are no longer on a gang injunction again, so that for employment and other purposes, they um, can report this action was also recommended by the, the, the gang commission downtown in the city, but of course they only have jurisdiction in the city of San Diego and I have the whole county. North County is not part of the city. And so, um, but um, working with, you know, I, I think this was a process that I started, you know, three years ago, but we're now at the end of the process. But I do have to say, Arcella, that while I, support removing the gang injunctions, again, because they're, they last a lifetime and they are not addressing the people who are currently a threat to the community. They're stale and we should not, as law enforcement, we should always be cognizant of not doing things that burden people forever, but to reward people when they move away from crime. Um, you know, gang violence is of great concern to me. And we are seeing an upward trend in gang violence and in ghost guns, which are untraceable guns being used by gangs. And that is something that I am, um, I am gonna fight against, but not using gang injunctions that are stale, but using, um, you know, fair methods to stop this violence because it, it is terrorizing neighborhoods. We've had a 25% increase in gang crimes and I am charged with protecting the community and I, I have to do it, but I wanna do it by fair means. I can't hear you, Alara. My apologies. Uh, I was just asking the 25% increase in gang crimes. Can you give us the time frame for that, if you know? Uh, the time frame was it was basically the last year. Uh, we compared th this June back to June to the year before. Um, so 25% more cases, um, 100 and something percent more uh, gang shootings. Um, since 2019, we prosecuted over 100 uh, cases that involve ghost guns and gang members. So it is, it is definitely not a good trend. Um, I don't know what, why. One of the, one of my guesses is that with school closures, um, that uh, kids had more time on their hands. They didn't have pro-social activities. Potentially, that caused a higher gang um, recruitment. But I think while uh, you know we are going to address it through proper prosecution, uh, because you know we've had two innocents killed in gang rivalry recently, um, we also want to address it through prevention and through giving kids pro-social activities and and engaging the community and making sure that there's one project that we're working on is summer internships for kids that are paid because we know that kids that come from poorer communities, you know, they need paid jobs. And so we're working with the county to provide those positive role models and internships. We have a very large juvenile diversion program to interrupt the, the, like I told you about the adult, we also have one on the juvenile side where we hold a charge for six months, we don't charge it and we send them to restorative justice and community-based um, treatment. Um, and then they end up with, with no record because the case was never charged. It's the first of its kind um, that we've seen in the nation. We're very excited about it. So we wanna provide all these opportunities, but you know, I really, um, I really, you know, want our community to come together to really discourage, um, discourage gang involvement and to really, because it, no one, no one wins with it. Not, not the person who joins the gang and not the community affected by it. Which unfortunately is the reality of the criminal justice system, right? There's really no winners. 
Yeah. So we, I appreciate your investment in the preventative approaches to deterring the crimes from occurring. Um, Arcella, is now a good time to move into our questions? Uh, yeah, we do have a few minutes for questions. And one of the questions that we see um, in the chat from uh, council member uh, Corina Contreras um, in Vista asking uh, if you could talk about um, officer uh, involved shootings um, and justified rulings. Um, and I know this has been a, a really sensitive issue, particularly in Vista um, over the years. I've been involved in community advocacy and we've seen um, this uh, come up. Um, we've had quite a few officer involved shootings there just over the years. So uh, council member Contreras is asking if you could talk about the percentages and how many of these have been uh, found justified. Um, so, so this is, you know, we, one of the things that I did do is I, I put more resources in our public corruption unit, which includes police misconduct and uh, public misconduct and, um, you know, I, I just think that the system only works if everybody's accountable under the law. Uh, I do think that most police officers, like, like most doctors, and, you know, want to wanna do the right thing. But I also think that when you have power, uh, being a bad actor, it really has a terrible ripple effect in destroying trust. So, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, action speaks louder than words, as you might recall, I, uh, our office charged two deputy sheriffs in Vista that were, um, were um, on camera, um, you know, uh, doing, applying force to two Hispanic males, uh, an older male, and we saw the images and you know, we took a no plea bargain position on the case. We took it to jury trial. Uh, I have to say that the jury found the, op the deputy sheriffs are not guilty. That uh, I don't think that means that our decision was incorrect. You know, uh, we thought that we could prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, applying the same standard to everybody. And we were courageous in bringing the case forward. We felt the evidence supported it. Um, that's not what the jury thought. Um, the same, you know, um, our office charged the first uh, murder case involving um, an officer under the new use of force laws that Dr. Weber passed. Again, this is not as a point of pride. This is as just a point of that everyone is accountable under the law and that case is pending. So I can't say any more about it. Um, we, we, we've, um, where the evidence supports um, beyond a reasonable doubt and the new law is more clear um, and um, then we, we do apply it. And uh, because I think that 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 is just the thing you have to do. I don't believe in going after officers or going after this group or going after that group. I don't believe in grandstanding. I believe you apply the law to everybody so the community knows that, uh, that the DA is going to be fair and is gonna judge everybody under the same standard. And that's what we've done. Um, um, I know that there's old cases. I know that there's, there's um, a lot of community grief over them. And I, you know, my condolences go out to those families. Uh, the law has changed the law and that's the law that I apply, but I can't apply the new law to old cases. It's not retroactive. I can only apply the new law to new cases. And that's what, um, that is what I'm doing. But the other thing that I've done is I've used uh, most of my asset forfeiture money that normally would go to upgrading equipment. I've used it for de-escalation training and which includes social intelligence, respect, implicit bias for police officers and sheriffs across the county. Because our capacity for training officers was only 300 officers a year. 
uh, because of PERT's capacity. But by, by investing $1.5 million um, in um, this de-escalation training that's post-certified and that is mobile, so it goes to each department and can train them, we've already trained 2,600 officers, even through COVID. And so we're on track to have all 5,000 approximate officers trained uh, in a year or so, and then begin again by updating the program and start again. Um, the training in includes how to deal with people in crisis, the escalation, crisis management, mental health, um, you know, uh, information. On how and we had NAMI and the National Association of Mental Illness work with us on this program. And it gets very high marks by the officers who go through it, uh, by community members that have reviewed it. So we're, we're trying to do things on every end, not again, not just the prosecution end, but the prevention end, just like with everything else that we do. In fact, um, our mission is based on the three Ps, which is to protect victims, prevent crime, harm where we can, and ethically prosecute crime, the three Ps method. Thank you, Summer. Thank you so much for your candidness and your willingness to join us. Um, I don't see that we have any questions. So I just, on behalf of Universidad Popular and the Latino community, I wanted to thank you for this time and this transparency that you've had in this conversation. I know we've touched on some pretty um, difficult questions. And um, for us as a community, I think it's so important to have these conversations because many times when Latinos interact with the criminal justice system, it's not just as a victim of DV or sexual assault or theft. Many times we are victims from racial uh, profiling or police bias or you know, uh, unfair sentences. So it is really important to us to have our voice heard. And I feel that you've listened to us and I'm very, uh, happy to know you have an open door because I know many of us in the community will want to come to you as these issues continue to take the center stage for our community. Thank you. Well, so I much. welcome this conversation. I'm, I'm really honored to join you. I know how much good um, Universidad does and, and in the community and, and everyone that's involved here. It's, it's my honor to join you. I've learned a lot through your questions and Again, um, Yoli and I are available if there is if there is anything you want to bring to our attention to make sure we, we serve everyone uh, and that everyone feels comfortable that we are your public servant. Thank you so much. And may I add that you have inspired the city attorney. The city attorney will now be joining us next. So everyone, please stay tuned for that. We're going to have a conversation with her and we'll talk about the differences. And so we're excited to learn about that. So thank you so very much. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, we look forward to the next one. So stay tuned. Um, and again, as community educators, we want uh, our community to learn. So um, our next session um, will be in Spanish and we hope to hopefully be able to meet in person again soon, but uh, greatly appreciate the time that everyone took uh, to join us this evening. Muchas gracias. Good night.